since I talked to Ramajoy quite a lot, I think I should uh, not say anything, but really just be a chair and open this uh, paper to, uh, to, to you all um, for your comments. Uh, the, the question is really the Ahmadi party, and I'm going to press you a little bit on that. But two quick comments before that on the figures you've shown 23 million of people between the 18 and 23 age group right. out of an 815 million is mm. not a large number. Mm. Uh, it's less than 4%. So I was wondering where this youth vote thing, you know, I mean, it's, it's in fact, I, I'm, I'm surprised for how, how low 23 million people are in, in that. So quick comments on that. The second that, uh, you know, when you mentioned the kind of issues at stake, uh, what I was always startled by was that uh, in the in the CSDS report, 32% said they had no comment, which I think is, a, I mean, it's, it's inconceivable that people will say, I have no comment when you ask what the issues at stake are. And then so I was wondering about that, because the other one, of course, the zero, who say they have no comment, if I had a question in the methodology, the first, the, the second one, the question, the first question. But, but coming to the Ahmadi party, um, there's been a lot of debate as to politically what is this animal? Uh, you know, where, where, who, what does it stand for and so on? And this is partly because, uh, I mean, I know for a fact, for example, for myself, the number of people on the left, on the CPIM, who supported the Ahmadi party during the Delhi elections. Uh, it's not something officially admitted, but I think everybody inside the CPIM knows that there is a certain sort of a, a tendency in that direction. There is, of course, a strongly Lohiite presence in the in the Ahmadi Party, mm -hmm. which has not got along well with the CPIM people. And then there is the corporate capitalist class who is supporting the Ahmadi Party as well. Uh, you know, I mean, the Infosys chap in Bangalore, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there is a certain kind of corporate. I mean, they would be not probably the Ambani's and the Tatas who do it, but there is a corporate presence mm -hmm. that the Ahmadi Party has. So, what then is it? Uh, you know, is it is it a new kind of political animal? Uh, with a new sort of color. This has a very specific political consequence because if the Congress party's vote is going to decline as much as it is, then who is replacing it is actually the question before us. Is the question, is, is it going to be such a fragmented vote that you're going to have an enormous plethora of people who are going to sort of say, pick up the pieces following the decline of the Congress, or is there going to be some entity that is going to replace the Congress in any credible manner, you know, as, as, as a successor entity, you might say, I mean, in a manner of speaking, Congress minus the dynasty, <laughs> or something like that. So that's, that's really the question. I mean, what is the Samadhi Party? Right. Uh, what's your understanding of it as a political entity? Right. Uh, so just, just take one question take, time, or, uh, take one more. Sure. Yeah. No, you go ahead. OK. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the first bit, you know, about the <clears throat> first time vote. I think one should, again, I was saying, I, I think that there's a bit of a confusion about the numbers, you know, classically first time, or even your sort of a young voters. I think the number of young voters, and I don't have the exact number, uh, is fairly significant. So I think that's what the sort of demographics of 18 to 25, and that's the demographics of the country as a whole. You know. So, so you know, about, almost half, half of the population. So, so I think the numbers the election commission has, has put out is you know, the people registered 18, between 18 and 23 in this time. So, so I think the numbers itself will be larger in that sort of age bracket. So I think that's why people are talking about the youth vote, the tourism, et cetera. Um, Excuse me, just for a minute. One, one estimate is is sixteen percent of the electorate will right. be will be in the youth category of that, that, um, that, sort of eighteen that's to one hundred twenty million, mm. not uh, twenty right. million. Yeah. Where does that one come from? I don't know. I think uh, you know uh, people are saying as much as one hundred fifty million, and mm. then there are others who are saying if it's yeah around hundred million would be a quarter. But again, yeah, one has to sort of check. Yeah. So I think the numbers I think will be fairly significant for the. Youth vote, and uh, you had a second question on the, uh, you know, besides the other one on the on the methodology of you know, you know, again, you know, I'm no expert in sort of you know, surveys, but it seems like you know, if you sort of go through the CSDS surveys, a lot of their questions have uh, this sort of no comment uh, space, which the other surveys you know that occupies a, a, a much sort of smaller space. You know, I, I won't pretend to know that I really know why why that is so, but it's an interesting thing. Usually people wouldn't say no comment, they'll say come up with something. So that's, that's interesting. And on the larger question on, on ARP, you know, what kind of beast the, the ARP is? I think they themselves are somewhat confused. You know, they, they meaning the, the, the ARP leadership. Um, so you know, I've been, you know, when I was last in Delhi, I was talking to you know, some of the, 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 you know, the sort of 
Queen and Kiran Diyak and the sort of the groups of people who were hanging around in what is now the AAP party headquarters, in, <laughs> yeah, the temporary headquarters in, in Hanuman Road in, in, in off Connaught Place. And I think there is a sort of a disjuncture between the visions of someone like, say, Yogendra, that we mentioned Loyal. Yogendra is, of course, one of these sort of prominent examples. And you know, someone like Kejriwal, who actually consciously says he's on record that he has no ideology. You know, sort of, it's a one track kind of agenda, you know, it's, it's and you know, corruption is, is, is the issue. And you know, everything in all roads kind of it. So I think there is a confusion on that count. But in the Delhi election, there was, you know, I briefly said, you should sort of look at the numbers and the way people voted, and the way they campaigned. I think they did manage to attract a lot of the, you know, not only just people from the sort of upper class posh colonies, but also from the resettlement colonies, the slums. So in that sense, you know, there are sort of promises of, you know, uh, you know so many, uh, you know, so, so much of water on a daily basis, you know, halving of electricity bills, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, that kind of populism, uh, you know, that I think appealed to a certain class, but I think the, the middle class, you know, is not you know, particularly comfortable with that. And then again, you know, the protests that Kejriwal himself, you know, went, took to the streets, and I think for the first time, chief minister sort of, you know, protesting in the streets. You know, that kind of uh, uh, displays, again, I think makes the, the middle class uncomfortable. And I think that's where the ARP, you know, ARP, I think really, you know, it find, find itself in a place where they themselves, I think, are trying to you know, figure out. And probably they've also sort of grown a bit more rapidly than they themselves expected. And that brings its own set of problems. And Yogendra, I remember, was telling me that you know, they really didn't want the Lok Sabha election, you know, because they, they had no hand in it. It was just a coincidence that it comes six months after Delhi. And he said that we're not in any way prepared for it. But despite that, they go and put up candidates, you know, they're aiming for 300 odd seats. I think they've already put up. So I think, you know, they should have probably scaled down membership, maybe contested in a few, you know, urban constituencies. You know, and the manifesto is something that they actually, you know, you mentioned, you know, what you know, the ideology, you know, um, they actually haven't been able to come up with a uh, ideology. So the, the, what I hear, I've been talking to some of them, you know, they're really sort of grappling with questions, and so that's delayed the release of their uh, manifesto. And finally, you know, replace, you know, who replaces? And I again, I, don't, I think sort of premature obituaries might be being written about the Congress. I think the Congress will be, you know, be decline, but it's too early to write it off. Up, I don't think really has the kind of wherewithal to. If there's anything like the Congress, but I think in certain states, certain you know, places, they, they are probably occupying the opposition space somewhat better than the Congress, at least in raising some of the issues, but again, you know, not likely to translate into the US. Um, it seems to me that this time there are a lot of people who, I'm uh, sorry, uh, there might be a lot of people who who are deciding to vote on who they hate less. Right? Um, a lot of people, okay, if I vote for Modi, uh, how much do I hate dynasty? If I vote for, for Congress, how much do I hate anti-sector ideals, right? And um, the Amadi Party sort of comes in there, sort of like the Green Party, in the, uh, draft into the Green Party, right? Um, but then there are these strategies where people are saying, look, uh, if you really hate Modi, then uh, when when you can vote in a state where, or in a place where you think the Congress will win, then go for the Aam Aadmi Party. Otherwise, you know, try try to vote for Congress, even though you know you don't really want to do it. You know, there's all these sort of strange discussions. Um, is there is there uh, any kind of idea of that percentage of people who really don't want to vote for either party and are really stuck this time? I think it's 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 a very uh, it's a bit more heightened this time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Taken in, uh, oh, very, uh, very quick one. Do you see the role of public relations uh, uh, coming up in this election? So, I mean, from from my point of view, at least, there are two parties that have run a rather effective PR campaign. Uh, one is the Amadi Party. The other is the BJP. Uh, their use of the social media space uh, has been underwritten a lot. But if you look at the numbers people that they have been uh, being able to bring out on the street far more effective than the Congress. Congress revamped its website fairly recently and they've employed a PR agency now uh, to uh, to do uh, uh, damage control. But but yes, your comments on this. Should I add one to perhaps? Anybody? 
Go ahead. Oh, please, come in. Thanks. Do you see any scenario where, do you see any, where the Christian community will be able to see that there's a need for Go ahead, go ahead, Ron, John. Yeah, um, yeah. On the first question on you know people who don't sort of you know sort of the, the, the lesser evil kind of thing, uh, but that's a phenomenon that you know occurs in, 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 in a lot of elections. But this time it might be somewhat heightened. But uh, here I think one has to really factor in also the, the, the uh, you know although there are these two national parties, you know most states you also or, or many of the states you actually also have a regional option. So uh, I think a lot of the vote, say in a place like West Bengal, uh, if you don't want to vote for, for say, you know, Modi or the Congress, you actually have a very viable op option, which is the Trinamool Congress. So I think what voters look for, and of course it's, uh, you know, one shouldn't you know, pretend that one knows the mind of, of voters or the voter. I think often it's, it's a case of you know, whom they are voting for, whether you know, that party organization has a credible shot at, at power of forming government. You know, otherwise, they feel that they might have you know, wasted the vote. You know. So, uh, so that, that, that nota kind of option. So I think in many of the states, you do have that option. So you have a viable you know, re regional option, uh, or a single, actually, a regional is a misnomer. It's a, a state party uh, which, which, which you, can, you can vote for. So I think that's one aspect where uh, one has to keep in mind in terms of where you know, people might be going. Uh, in, in, as for public relations, uh, you know, I think this phenomenon, you know, I think, really first came starkly uh, to the it was foregrounded in, in 2004. That whole in India shining was uh, sort of thought to be a very clever, pithy slogan, which, which you know, didn't it, it didn't work out that way. And from 2004, I think all parties have been, you know, taking on board, you know, PR agencies. And this time, I think the BJP has a, you know, it's uh, you know that song. Uh, where you know, Modi kind of chimes in, and you know this lyricist, what is Prashun Joshi, or Prashun Pand, uh, anyway, Joshi, Joshi yeah, uh, has 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 given the lyrics. You know, he's a for those who don't know, famous sort of you know, Bollywood lyricist. So I think these things have been happening. I think all parties have plugged in, but the Congress, you're right, for some odd reason, has been somewhat behind you know the the, 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 the others, you know, especially the BJP and the and the AAP in some ways, you know, because it was an urban phenomenon. I think, especially for the Delhi election and the run-up to the Delhi election, was very smart at sort of you know using social media, you know, uh, uh, Twitter, etc. Now, you know, how much of that will sort of have an impact in, on, on a national scale? We don't know. But in the more urban constituencies, conceivably, you know, that could be that could be a factor. And for the BJP, I think another thing <laughs> needs to mention. I think the, the over, you know, if you look at NRIs. I think BJP really does, you know, has overwhelming support. If it, and, you know, but with ARP, I think there has been some, you know, I think some of that segment because, you know, uh, the ARP, a lot of the funding that there is for Delhi, like a significant component was from NRIs and particularly yeah, Singapore. You know, the US led the, the numbers, but Singapore. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think there is a sort of churn happening there in terms of the presence of social media, using social media, but I think very much in its still in its incipient state, but PR agencies, I think, you know, most parties are using, even, you know, Samajwadi party, which is kind of think is kind of, you know, a little behind the curve, and, you know, they have a fairly slick campaign, I watch, you know, I, I subscribe to any TV channel here, they have a fairly slick, you know, campaign promoting UP, you know. That's a tourism board, that's a tourism uh, No, I think they're doing something on, on is that, okay, yeah, anyway, but so I think, yeah, so, so I think, you know, people are using and uh, the, the, the final question is, is in, in the BJP, the option of a BJP without, without Modi. Uh, you know, I don't think it's inconceivable because, uh, you know, again, it depends on the numbers. If they have the num kind of numbers that the opinion polls that I referred to uh, were, were giving them, you know, something like, you know, 200 odd for the BJP itself with its current set of allies, 230, then, you know, I think they're, you know, close enough that, you know, there's the sort a of simple majority mark of 273 to attract coalition partners because, you you know, it's another 40 odd and, you know, for the right price, both figuratively and met metaphorically, you can get regional parties on board. So I think that would ensure uh, uh, a 200 plus for the BGP would ensure a BJP 
with, with movies bandwidths, but a below 200 uh, uh, showing, you know, maybe something in the range of 160 to 180, conceivably, I think, you know, the BJP might be in a position where it might have to jettison Modi. And there is this sort of conspiracy theory that has come up, and I've discussed with some of my colleagues here, uh, where, you know, the, the BJP president, uh, Raj, a person by the name of Rajnath Singh, who really doesn't have much of a, a popular base, he, and there are others, like, uh, you know, people who are familiar with Indian politics, a man called Arun Jetli. You know, these are people who don't have much of a popular base. They're all contesting elections. They are some of the most enthusiastic backers of, 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 of Modi. Uh, whereas some of the old guard, uh, again, people who are sort of reading up, uh, you know, people like Adwani, you know, now we have just, you know, are, 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 are somewhat you know, skeptical of, of Modi. So I think the people, you know, these set of people who have really, you know, most support based by themselves are the ones, you know, hanging on to the coattails of, of, of Modi. And if there's a situation where, you know, they need to take on partners who are uncomfortable with Modi, you know, these are the people who could possibly step in. You know, Rajnath Singh, Arun Jaitley, you know, they might be more acceptable figures to say someone, a party like the Trinamool Congress. You know, Trinamool Congress, you know, a quarter of the population in, uh, in West Bengal is Muslim. So, uh, you know, uh, Trinamool wins a substantial chunk of, you know, the whole. And so they would be really in a fix if, it, if, if they were to back a Modi-led BJP, although the Trinamool was part of the Vajpayee-led uh, you know, BJP coalition. So, you know, someone other than Modi then makes it, you know, a little easier for, for the Trinamool, conceivably. Three. So, uh, three factors that we didn't talk about, I just want to get your reactions to it. Um, one, it's interesting, and I know my, my field is comparative, also comparing this to other contexts. Uh, again, this year, just like in 2009, India goes to elections at the same time as Indonesia. Uh, and, and that's sort of interesting that. Uh, in some ways, the same things that you say about Indian democracy, you could also say about Indonesia in terms of the scale of the difficulty of holding the elections and factors like that. So I'm sort of thinking, Indonesia, uh, so I think today or yesterday, the Straits Times reports that uh, overseas citizens can vote in that. And, and you mentioned the AP and the BJP dimension with respect to NRIs. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, what's your sense of that? Do you think that will become significant as we go forward? I don't know if there are demands for it. But it seems that increasingly a lot of countries are thinking of allowing overseas citizens to vote. And that's interesting that that's missing from our analysis mm. and how would that impact things. Second, um, gender. This also follows from Indonesian uh, politics. So in Indonesia, I think there is a requirement that a certain percentage of candidates have to be women. Uh, and so at one level in India, you could say, that gender is a factor. I mean, if there is at all a third front likelihood, uh, people in West Bengal and Tamil Nadu getting quite excited about either Mamata or, or Aman, Jalalita becoming prime minister. And there are ad campaigns focusing on that prospect. So that's interesting. But if my sense is, and you may have the numbers, that if you look at just like the Patrick French hereditary sort of, uh, statistics for gender, I think the Indian elections still do very, very poorly in terms of the number of people who are candidates. Um, and, and the third, absence, and, and I'm sort of wondering how that impacts it. So I don't know whether there are any state elections being simultaneously held with the national election at this time. And, and that's interesting that in the past, that used to sometimes play a factor, that you have a state election at the same time as the Lok Sabha election. And then people, would, the pundits would spend a lot of time trying to see how voters behave. Do they try and vote for one party at the state level and another at the national level? How that impacts? Uh, and that's again some a dynamic which is absent this time, or not that uh, played up. And is that a conscious trend that the election commission has moved towards? And how do you think that might impact the formation of central circumstances? Can I, can I just throw in one then? Is it, um, uh, it's going back and rather than uh, following on from those interesting questions. Um, I mean, uh, I. I I'm broadly sympathetic to your view that you know it's far too early to to write off the, the Congress, and as we've discussed. You know, we both think I think there is a, a strong sort of core of, of of support for for Congress, kind of 
no matter what they do, sort of, sort of thing. But I must say, I find it very hard to um, imagine where the Congress is going to pick up 130 seats, which is pretty much what both the, both the polls, from the data from which you, you, you show, suggest. Um, you know, whether the Congress is going to pick up as many as 12 seats in the erstwhile Andhra Pradesh, I, I find that very, very hard to, uh, to, to imagine. And I just wonder what your sense of, of you know, where they're going to pick up um, those 130 seats. Um, should I just? Yeah. Take those? yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think a uh, very interesting point made by Arun on sort of comparisons mm -hmm. with Indonesia. One thing I think India has done well, you know, you just mentioned the, the difficulty of the election. I think the election commission is, of course, one of the most highly rated institutions in India. You know, we do surveys along, you know, I think that tops the list of the most trusted institution, followed by the Supreme Court and the political parties at the bottom. And uh, so in the way the elections are conducted, you know, in terms of you know, whether they're free or fair, I think India has, you know, I think, made fairly dramatic strides. You know, I can sort of testify, you know, my journalist days, you know, when I covered elections, say, you know, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, in West Bengal, you know, you could see instances of, of, of rigging, you know, West Bengal was famous for something called scientific rigging, rigging which the communists had you know, perfected, you know, at certain times of the day when they captured the booth. You know, some of that has gone down with, with the use of the electronic you know, voting machine. And so I think, in, on that count, you know, I think the election commission on record, I think, has, it is something to be you know, fairly you know, proud of. But uh, in terms of you know, overseas citizens, uh, it, there doesn't seem to be that much. I just read an item, and this is something I haven't really researched, where the election commission has thrown the ball to the government's court uh, saying, you know, it's for, you know, of course the election commission, I think on this count, you know, I think it needs legislation to, to enable uh, overseas citizens. And I think there are certain, you know, logistics involved there, not insurmountable, but I think, uh, you know, the issues out there, but not top of the agenda, but increasingly with, you know, number of NRIs, you know, diaspora, you know, it, it should be a, an issue, but oddly enough, doesn't seem to be that much of an issue. You know, again, I don't have a very good answer. Gender, yeah, you know, I think the, you know, I don't have the exact statistics, the numbers, but yeah, you know, it's not uh, a very happy situation if you look at women's representation, you know, not just in, 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 in the national parliament, but also in the state assemblies. Um, you know, some, many other uh, 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 countries do have uh, uh, quotas, uh, especially developing you know, countries. India, of course, as some of you might be aware, you know, that women's reservation bill, you know, which does uh, aim to put in a quota for or a reservation for women uh, 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 in Parliament hasn't passed through for various reasons. You know, there's been the Congress, on the face of it, has you know, tried to push it through on different occasions, but it's often the the regional parties that have sort of scuppered the thing. But even the Congress's intentions, you know, one can't be. You know, it's often like the Congress put you know, uh, takes the legislation to Parliament almost on the expectation that you know someone will scuttle it. You know. So there are these <laughs> calculations going on. So I think, yeah. But of course, you know, on the other side, as you mentioned, there are you know powerful women leaders. So India had a pri woman prime minister far, of, you know, way before. You know, of course, America still hasn't had a woman president. So Indira Gandhi, you know, arguably one of the most you know, sort of you know, dominating, powerful sort of prime ministers in India way back in, in '77. And oddly enough, South Asia does tend to throw up, you know, women women leaders. You know, so in in Bangladesh, we have the two two women. So, uh, so, um, so, yeah. So, in that sense, in a symbol at a symbolic level, you do have, you know, not at the just at the prime minister level, but you know, you do have very strong regional leaders. You mentioned Jayalalitha, Mamata, uh, uh, um, Mayavati. So there is the dis disconnect, you know, between you, know, you have party leaders, but you don't have at, at, at a greater level, you know, greater representation uh, for for women. Bit of a conundrum there. Again, I don't have an answer to why it's not happening. And your final uh, question was, you know, whether, you know, there's a conscious decision to separate state elections from... Um, so I guess Andhra Pradesh, John... It will be. Uh, yeah, yeah, so they actually could have gone, I think, technically, uh, to elections along with the national elections. I think you're right. There, uh, uh, there, I think there is a conscious decision by the election commission uh, because of the sort of you know, the scale, the logistics, 
of the, the operation. And this time they've actually sprung it out over nine phases, which is also sort of you know, the first time they're doing it over you know, one and a half months. So I don't think they want to you know, factor in another uh, state election. Even Delhi who now is under left-wing governor's rule after the Aman party, you know, after that 49-day government. So they too need to go to election. And I think there's a six-month window. They could have conceivably gone to election along with, again, they decided, um, you know, again, Haryana comes. So I think it's a conscious decision to separate state elections from um, parliamentary, just because of the, the, the logistics involved. And, you know, where the Congress will win its seats? Yeah, that's sort of a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, but I think precisely, I think the, the answer is, is, is in some way in a question. Because the Congress has a national presence where, you know, as if you were, you recall some of the statistics that I was shown. You know, it's been, you know, last election it won 28% of the votes. Now, you know, if it sort of comes down, say, to what the BJP won last time, say, 18, dramatic fall. You know, the BJP still won, uh, you know, 100 and, what was it, 120 odd, yeah, hundred sixteen or whatever the number was seats. So conceivably, the Congress, even with that kind of numbers, will win, you know, they, they won't sweep states. But I think they'll win a small number of seats from almost every every uh, state in India. And that, I think, will, I don't think they're going to get big numbers. The two states where, you know, this is again, you know, surveys versus sort of, you know, gut feeling and talking to journalists who are out there, you know. I was, uh, Assam, smaller state, uh, one of the smaller with 14 seats. It seems it's going to buck the national trend and, and, and uh, you know, Congress, even the surveys actually show Congress doing you know, quite well in Assam, you know, because that might be what something like you know, 10 seats. Uh, Karnataka is another seat, but some opinion surveys are writing them off. But I, again, you know, haven't talked. You know, uh, uh, you know it's, it's got 20 plus seats. The Congress did well in the last election. They could conceivably win, you know, again, something within you know, 10. So that kind of adds up. And again, in a lot of states, I think, you know, including states like Gujarat, the Congress didn't do too badly in Gujarat. You know, they had 10 plus seats, even with sort of, you know, the Modi's dominance, etc. So, you know, all those numbers, you know, Maharashtra, I think you know, the Congress might just pull out a few seats. Again, I think part of the thing is the Congress, I think the underestimation of, of, of the Congress and, and the fact that the BJP almost believes or is behaving in, in a manner that they, you know, won the election. I think in some ways you can never underestimate the voter. And as we discussed, I think these, some of these surveys show a lot of voters, you know, a large, again, the CSDA survey shows a quarter of the voters apparently, you know, take the decision on to vote in the last two days or even in the last. So in a lot of this Modi wave, the media hype, you know, might all be sort of, you know, and these surveys might all be sort of, you know, you know they might not be getting it totally wrong, but maybe they might be slightly off. So I think I think the Congress, the only way they can win is you know the small yeah. cluster of seats, so the sixes, the ten. You know, if you add it up over twenty seats, states. it actually comes up to hundred you know, plus. But yeah, I don't think you know that conceivably they don't have a chance of winning you know more than 120, 130 seats. But again, you know, we'll be proved wrong earlier. Uh, Rana Joy, before I thank you for a very interesting presentation and, and close the, uh, the afternoon session, I wonder if you'd consent to be pinned against the wall and um, answer the question, do you expect a Modi government? Well, uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, and th thank you all very much, and, and we, we thank you a lot for a very interesting presentation.